So I see a lot of new faces for these workshops. I see a lot of familiar faces. So who here, is this is your first Body Signals workshop? Raise your hands. Right, guys, I know it's your first one. And I know a lot of you have been to a lot of these things before. So every single month we take a different symptom or body signal and we talk about it. This month we're talking about losing some weight for the summer, okay? Who here could stand to lose a few pounds? I mean, honestly, we're all here for a reason, right? Even myself. Um, so that's, that's ultimately what we're going to be talking about today. And the reason we do these things is it's really important that we approach health as a whole in our office. Many of you know that it's not just getting your spine adjusted, although it's a really important part of keeping your body healthy. We talked about things like nutrition. We have Lindsay, our nutritional consult. Who here has done a nutritional consult with Lindsay before? Anybody? Yeah, we've had a couple. So yeah, if you guys have questions about that kind of stuff, we have lots of resources in the office to help you guys reach your goals. Because that's what it all is. Who, everybody remembers their first day in the office, right? What's one of the first things we did when we were sitting down, needed me talking about things? Yeah, we set goals. And what are most of our goals when we start out with? Not feeling better, right? When I met most of you, who here had pain when we met for the first time? Just about everybody in this room. And that's pretty much 99.9% .9 of the people when I meet them the first time, they have some kind of pain. So their immediate goal is feel better. But then as they start feeling better, they realize there's a lot more to life than just feeling good, looking good. And that's what we're gonna be talking about a lot today. So the five singles workshop. When, I, when we're talking about health, I like to think of it as like a bonfire. So there's three crucial components to any fire. What are those? Air. The answer's on the slide. You can't get it wrong, guys. So fuel. You need a fuel source, right? You need some air, and you need a spark. So what are we calling the fuel? Yeah, what we put into our body. What's the air? Exercise. Moving. Getting up and moving around. Exercise, exactly. And what's the spark? Thinking. Our mental outlook. So who here knows what the definition of health is? Any, any, anybody want to hazard a guess? Did you just go to the Better Results Fast Workshop with Dr. Matt? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I like it. What do you think the most common answer I get when I ask people what does it mean to be healthiest? Feel good. That's the number one. What's the second one? Well, I wish that would. It's feel good, look good are the most common answers I get. But what does it feel like to have something like diabetes, especially earlier stage diabetes where you're not, things are shutting down? What does it feel like to have hypertension, especially earlier stage hypertension? You don't feel it at all, right? What's the first symptom of the majority of heart attacks? It's actually the heart attack that the person's having that sometimes kills the person. So they seem fine, but then all of a sudden they're in crisis. So we know that just feeling good, looking good, there's got to be a lot more to health. Or how about this one? Who here has known somebody seems fine, seems fine, seems fine, boom, stage four cancer? Pretty much everybody knows somebody like that today, unfortunately. And that person, it wasn't like that cancer just popped up overnight and just ramped out of control. That was something that was slowly growing inside them for a long period of time. So our definition of health has to be more all-encompassing than I feel good, I look good. So the Dorland's definition that you were, you were saying is, the absence of physical, mental, and uh, social infirmity or something like that, not just feeling good, looking good. So it takes, I've seen definitions that take into account things like your spirituality, your connection to God, or whatever you want to call it. There's a higher power out there if you choose to believe that and your connection to that. A lot of definitions even take that into account. So that's why we think of it as all of this together, not just the fuel, not just the air, not just the spark, it's everything together we're just going to get that roaring fire going. So, we got to ask ourselves, what are our objectives? Kind of like day one when most of us met, we talked about what are our goals. What are your objectives with this workshop? Do you want to lose weight? Do you want to be healthier, avoid diseases? What are some of the diseases that are associated with being obese? Diabetes. Diabetes. High blood pressure. High blood pressure, hypertension, which leads to a lot of cardiovascular problems. Uh, cancer. Who here has ever heard that cancer is a metabolic disease? 
So a lot of, a lot of, that's good. It's, it's starting to come out. It's not like a new concept, but it's some, something that's starting to get some more traction. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, too. Because a lot of times we're pointing at the genes, the genes, the genes, the genes. But a lot of it we're starting to discover. It's really when metabolic processes break down. Does anybody here know what mitochondria are? Going to the biology class way back when. So a little tiny thing in every cell. It's like the power factory in the cell. And there are, they're starting to find out that a lot of these cancers that we're finding, it's when these mitochondria break down and they're no longer synthesized, synthesizing energy like they're supposed to, they're fermenting to create energy. And that fermentation pro process is what creates toxicity and then it all starts to cascade out of control from there. So uh, are we trying to make ourselves faster, stronger? Are we trying to increase overall performance? What are our goals? Those are the questions you have to answer for yourself because quite honestly, if you don't set goals for yourself, what's gonna happen? You don't make any progress, right? If I'm, if I'm target shooting, I like to shoot things. Uh, if I'm target shooting and I'm just shooting off in the space, not really shooting at a target, do I know if I'm improving my marksmanship? No, I need a target to shoot at, right? That's what we're talking about find your objectives. And that's something that's got to come personally from inside all of you. But hopefully after today, you guys have some better concepts on things that you want to think about. So improving your biomarkers, so your blood levels, things like blood sugar, things like that. Uh, increasing performance, we already said that, and healing better. So obesity is an epidemic these days, okay? This is something that we equate to things like poor diet, inadequate exercise, and then what else? Medication. Medications, exactly. So it's not just one thing that's the problem. That's why we can't just look at it as, oh, I just got to address the diet, or oh, I just got to exercise, or oh, I just got to take this pill or stop taking this pill. Everything we do has an impact on our health and the way our body is affected. And like I was saying earlier, this, the research is leaning heavily towards cancer itself isn't so much a genetic problem, it's a metabolic problem. It's when your metabolic pathways break down and don't work properly, that starts that cascade of things not functioning like they're supposed to, and a lot of things have to fail along the way for your body to develop full-blown cancer, but all these things are those little building blocks that when they start falling, it's like the dominoes start going. And we drastically increase the uh, intake of drugs in this country. Who, uh, you just saw the workshop. How much of the medication do we take in this country? In the world? Do you remember? Which that? 90 or 80? It was a lot. Over 40%, yeah. We take over 40% of all the medications in the world. Or no, I think it was 70, you're right, 70%, but we're 40% of the population. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I don't have a slide in front of me. I need to pull those up before I start having those. So, obesity. We hit, set, hit all three of these heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. These are the three big ones that this epidemic of obesity is causing in our country. And not just our country anymore, it's becoming a thing around the world. Has anybody watched any documentaries on places like China? places where historically they didn't have a lot of diabetes, obesity, and stuff like that, but now what's happening in places like China? They're getting more westernized, right? They're having a lot more of these healthy or unhealthy food choices available in abundance like we have here. And what do you think is happening in China now? Diabetes is going up, people are getting fatter, heart disease is going up. All these problems that are becoming a common problem over here, unfortunately, we're starting to see in a lot of these developing countries around the world. So, we're talking body signals here. Symptoms. Fat is a symptom. It's a sign that something's not working properly. And sometimes that's painful for us to hear. I mean, we have a, a workshop that I did, because I've, I've lost a lot of weight over the last few months doing fasting and things like that. But there was a workshop that I recorded. This was when I first started working with, with back when we were still house family chiropractic. And every time I see it, I, I just cringe at it because I was probably about 30 pounds heavier. I hadn't cut my hair in a while, so I was pretty shaggy. I had a crappy goatee thing going on. And I just looked like garbage. And I look at that and I was like, I can't believe I used to look at that. And I thought that was okay. <laughs> but 
what happens? Has anybody ever heard you don't notice your hair growing because you see yourself in the mirror every single day? A lot of these changes don't blow up overnight, right? They're things that slowly start to happen over time. And then something that's maybe unhealthy becomes more of our normal. And now we're, our, our new normal is down here, less healthy. And then maybe life gets crazy, busy, stressful, and now I'm eating up more often. I'm making more poor decisions. And that becomes more of a normal. And now our new threshold for normal is slightly less healthy. It's not like we just all decided one day to be like, hey, we're just gonna stop eating healthy and do all this stuff and just everything knows that plummets down. These are decisions that we make over time that have impacts on us over the course of our lives. And not only our lives, who else gets affected by it? Family. Yeah, our families, our children. Where do we learn how to eat as kids? From your parents, right? If unfortunately your parents didn't have the best eating habits, where do you learn? Not the best eating habits. And what's normal for you? Not the best eating habits. So that's what these workshops are about. What we're doing in this country as far as our healthcare system, we have what we call our healthcare system. I know some of you have heard me talk about this before. I prefer to refer to it as a sick care system. Because what do we do? We get sick, what do we do? Go to the doctor. Go to the doctor. What does the doctor do? Gives you a medication or something like that. The pill does what? Makes you, it makes you better, right? And that's our model. But we don't really address our health until when? Until you're sick, right? Does that seem a little bit crazy to some of us? I mean, we got medications that were being prescribed to offset the side effects of medications. And the whole concept of side effects kind of drives me a little bit nuts because you take a medication, it does what it does. If I'm taking a medication to lower my blood pressure, that medication has repercussions on my entire body. Now I want it to lower my blood pressure, so that's the primary function. All these other things that, that, that the Micro Machine Man rattles off at the end of the commercial, all these side effects, they sound less harmful, right? Because it's a side effect. It wasn't supposed to do that. But we look at something like Viagra, how was Viagra discovered? What was that for originally? Yeah, heart issues, basically. And then they found out, oh, the side effect, we could make a lot more money marketing it for something else other than what we originally intended it for. So that's how a lot of these things happen. And we call them side effects because they sound so benign and innocent. But if a side effect is death, if a side effect is suicidal thoughts and tendencies, or uh, you got diarrhea and constipation at the same time, I mean, you listen to these side effects that they listen at the end of the thing, it's crazy. I mean, we've got a day quilt, we've got a night quilt. You give it long enough, they'll, get, they'll have an afternoon pill for us. It doesn't help us get through that the rest of the day. And I'm not joking. I, I, I seriously believe that one day we'll have something like that. So all we're trying to do across the street with what we're doing with these workshops is change our mindset. And that's all I will ask of you guys as we're here. You're all engaging with me pretty well, which I really appreciate. But I want you to think. And I'm not even asking that you think like me. I just want you to think. Think about what I'm talking about and decide what you want to believe. Because ultimately we have this sick care system that we call a health care system, but it's all based around when we're sick. Whereas we start addressing these problems, what do we do when we get sick? If we're trying to take care of ourselves. Take what was that? Take pill. Well, okay, so say we're not even doing the, me the medicine route. Get our rest, maybe drink the fluids, maybe take some vitamin C, all this kind of stuff, yeah? What do you think would happen if we did all that stuff when we were healthy? Maybe when you get sick so much. So that's what it is. It's all about trying to think about things in terms of what can I do to stop myself from getting into crisis so I don't got to deal with it. That is a symptom. So extra adipose. Uh, we're going to talk about hormone imbalance. Okay. So everybody here knows what hormones are, right? We don't have to have that conversation. There's something. There's signals in the body, chemicals in the body that are produced in various parts of the body that control all kinds of function. Appetite is one of those things, okay? So an example of hormone imbalance, let's see here. So insulin, what's insulin do? Lowers your blood sugar. Yeah, it takes the blood out, of the sugar out of the blood so your body can use it for other things. Has anybody heard of something like uh, ghrelin? not as common as one. So that's something that stimulates things like appetite. 
there's all these hormones that when they get out of balance, what happens when we have diabetes? What's not working so well? Your pancreas. Yeah, your pancreas. And what's your pancreas mean? Insulin. So when you have diabetes, we have a blood sugar problem, right? Your body's not regulating that blood sugar like it's supposed to. That's because these hormones are not in balance, okay? And it could be a lot of things causing it. It could be the actual pancreas itself not working properly. It could be irritation from the nerves in the spine that communicate to that pancreas not working properly. It could be something completely up, out there, not even affecting the pancreas, but it affects the insulin in the body. So that's what these workshops are about, is trying to dig into these concepts. And then we add on top of that our food choices, which a lot of the food choices are what today? Fast food. Fast food, processed food, that's the word I was really looking for, is the processed stuff. We have all these refined things. What does wheat look like in the field? What color is it? Brown. Brown, right? Why is it white when it comes in the bag in that flower? What are they doing? Yeah, bleaching it, putting all these chemicals in it. And then now they're getting tricky. Now you can buy that brown, fro brown flower. You know what some of those are still doing? All the same stuff to make it white, but then they do something to make it brown again after the fact. It's like, why do they have to adulterate it so much that we get to this point where it's basically nutritionally dead? But that's a very, very common thing that we have in our country. And not even in our country, in this world. We have energy imbalances, sleep problems. So, who here, mine's hooked up to here recording right now, but we all have those cell phones, right? Who here has a cell phone? <laughs> who here knows that they inherently spend too much time on that cell phone? If we're being honest with ourselves, probably most of us. And what do those cell phones produce? Screens, tablets. Sorry? It's a light, yeah. And that affects your pituitary gland, your pineal gland. That creates the sensation of being awake and alert. So you ever look at somebody who's spending hours at night on their tablet, on their laptop, on their cell phone, and all of a sudden they're an insomniac? Why is that? Because we have this artificial light source that's blasting our face, that's stimulating the brain. The brain's getting the same messages as if the sun was rising and saying, hey, it's time to get up and be alert. And your body's creating chemicals, hormones, that react to that, that make it harder for us to fall asleep. So we're going to talk about things like heat fasting and things like that to help us get a better sleep. Because when do we do all of our heel work? It's when we're sleeping, right? How much sleep are we supposed to get every night? Eight hours. Yeah, eight hours is a pretty good number. I mean, some people will argue six or something like that, but eight hours is a pretty good number to go towards. We also have... What's this word? Stress. Who here is, has stress in their life? Silly question, right? Whose life is more stressful this year than it was last year? Who anticipates next year might be more stressful than this year? Life is stressful, people, and it's not getting less stressful. And I was just having a conversation with a patient about this the other day. They were saying, oh, I got rid of this source of stress. But then they were talking about all these other stresses that came with the source of stress they got with. And I was like, that's my experience with stress, is it never goes away. You just trade one form of stress for another form of stress. You know, maybe at one point my stress was built, paying my student loans off and stuff like that. And then maybe I'm making more income, but now having more income, I have more bills and things that I want to pay. I have more things I want to go out and do. That creates more stress. You have more income, who comes looking for donations and stuff like that? So every time we change something, we're trading out one form of stress for another, We've got to learn how to cope with our stress better. So regaining control of our hormones. It's all about the quality of the food. It's all about the quantity of the food that we're eating. It's about when we're eating the food and maintaining activity levels that are healthy, helping to limit the social stress and getting better sleep, okay? So there are five lies that are very, very common when it comes to dieting. And honestly, I don't even like the term dieting because who here thinks of diet and has a positive connotation in their mind? Does anybody? There's a cheesy, I think it was Richard Simmons that said, it's not a diet, it's a live it. 
I like that a lot better. Because what does that imply? It's a lifestyle change. Exactly. Whereas when I'm dieting, I feel like I'm taking something away from myself. I feel like I'm punishing myself in some way. Whereas I'm, I'm choosing good, healthy foods, and I'm filling myself up, and I'm not starving myself, that's actually a lot healthier than trying to just restrict everything to try to shed a few pounds, ultimately to gain them back when you crash off your diet. So first one, weight problems just run in my family. Who's heard that or maybe even said that? Yeah, and there are genetic factors that come into play, but by and large, our genes haven't changed for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We still have the same genes inside of our bodies as way back in like the hunter-gatherer days when we were living in caves and stuff like that. Or just keep eating less and you'll lose weight. Good idea, bad idea? Yeah. What do you guys think? Yeah, starving yourself, what does that do? Yeah, your body's like, okay, every little calorie I got, I'm gonna try to hang on to it, and what does it try to hang on to it as? Yeah, it stores it up as fat. Or I'll just work it off at the gym. Who's here guilty of that? I know I'm guilty of this one. I got a brand new elliptical, I worked out really hard, and it was like, oh, I'm sweaty, I just spent a half hour on that thing, I burned 300 calories, I'm gonna treat myself, I'm gonna go eat. <laughs> How many calories do you think I ate? <laughs> a lot more than 300, and it was a lot easier and faster to eat that many calories than to spend a half hour on the elliptical. And that's why those kind of crash diets and things like that, they don't really work. They might get you some short-term results, but they're not sustainable. Or just calories are calories. Calories in, calories out. Now I know there was a study, I, people have cited this one on me before when I talk about this, where the guy who lost a bunch of weight eating nothing but like Twinkies or something like that, he was just straight up nerd, calculated calories, and that's all he ate. But the flip side of that story is, you think that guy was pretty healthy even though he managed to lose weight? Dr. Matt likes to say, is 500 calories of broccoli the same as 500 calories worth of McDonald's? No, right? A lot healthier to eat those plant broccoli vegetables than to get all your sources from those processed fried foods. And sleep has nothing to do with it. True or false? Exactly. So, weight problems run in my family. Genes, environment versus lifestyle, okay? If we have genes, if the problem is the genes, look at this graph, this kind of tells it all. Because again, our genes aren't changing. This is back in 1990. You can see those percentages down here at the far end in the white. I'll get on this side so you guys can see. There's no data. That light blue, so the stuff we're seeing here, that's 0%. This is obesity trends. All the way to the dark colors that we see in like Alabama and I can't remember what state that is. North Virginia. West Virginia. West Virginia. Thank you. Um, but by 2006, less than what? 16 years? 20 years? That's where it all is. Do you think our, gene, our genes change that much in that amount of time? So that right there really proves that it's not the genes that are the problem. It's the choices that we're making. It's the lifestyles that we have. It's the food choices that we make and the lack of exercise that we get. So we got to eat, we got to move, and we got to think positive. Healthy comes in all shapes and sizes. So when we talk about genes, people have very different body types. I'm kind of like the lanky, if you look at my brothers, they're both really tall and a lot skinnier than I am. I'm the one that's a little bit shorter and a little bit chunkier, okay? My girlfriend, she's about this tall, she's got a fuller frame. We all have different body types, and that's an excuse that sometimes we use to make ourselves feel better about being heavier, but we know that if there's other ways we can measure things like body fat percentages, muscle content, and things like that. And if your body type happens to be the type that stores up a little bit more padding around the waist, or maybe the chest, or maybe the belly or something like that, yeah, there is a normal component to that, but it is a convenient excuse that a lot of us like to go to, because what's easier, making changes or making excuses? It is, right? So 15 pounds healthier. When we're talking about 15 pounds healthier, I'm not necessarily saying losing 15 pounds. Because what weighs more than fat? Muscle weighs more than fat, right? So say I lost 10 pounds of fat, but then I gained five pounds of muscle. 
Would I be healthier? What do you guys think? Because what does muscle do? Burns fat, right? When you're contracting muscles, when you're using your muscles, that's using energy. What does fat do? Fat just stored up as energy. This person's trying to get in. Other door. So biomarkers. Has anybody ever measured their fat percentage with those little calipers and things like that? There's other ways you can do it. You could do it like with a body tank where you submerge yourself. There's like the DEXA scans. There's lots of ways you can do it. But if you're going to be doing it, you want to be sticking consistently with the same way you measure. Okay? One of the worst measurements, in my opinion, is the scale. Because what doesn't the scale tell us? Yeah, it doesn't tell me how much of this is fat, how much of this is muscle. I could lose a bunch of weight and I feel better about it. But then what happens when I eat a little bit more and then I step on the scale, and this happened after a fast. So I got done fasting, I ate something, my body weight went up like 15 pounds. And I was like, holy crap, I gained a lot of weight. What do you think most of that weight was? Exactly, as soon as I started putting food back into my body after an extended fast, my body started retaining a lot more of the water. And then over the next couple days, it kind of regulated out. Eat less, you'll lose, you'll lose weight. So we already kind of touched on it. Why is it unsustainable? What was that? Yeah, you need to eat. Okay, your body needs energy. And if you stop eating, if you start denying it energy, and I know I just mentioned water fasting, and that's something I think we're going to do a workshop so I can deep dive into that. Because I was going to get in a lot more into that one, but when I was making the PowerPoint slides, I was like, you guys probably don't want to be here for three hours tonight. So that'll be a topic for another day because there is a lot of benefits to fasting, intermittent fasting, however you want to do it. And I think I'm going to do a deep dive into that into a future, a future workshop if there's people that are interested in that. But you need energy. And even when I'm fasting, I know that there's going to be an end to that fast where I'm going to be re recharging my body with healthy sources of nutrition. And when we restrict things, what happens? Your body goes into starvation mode, right? When you're in starvation mode, what's its primary concern? Yeah, saving every little bit of energy that it can. And fat's the way it does it. So when we do these crash diets, if we're completely denying our food, maybe we will start burning food. But where do we tend to store our fat? Ideally, that's the first place it starts to deposit. Why is that? What do you guys think? Our organs are there. That is one of these protection. So let's take ourselves back to a time way before any of us were alive. Hunter-gatherer days. If I put all my fat on my arms or on my legs, and my job is to go out and maybe shoot a deer with a bow or a spear or something like that, but all my fat's on my legs and my arms, what's gonna be in the way when I'm trying to get that animal? With my fat stored up on my belly, I can still function and use my arms and get around. So that's one of the reasons this is the most stubborn place for our bodies to lose the fat, is your body's intelligent, and that's just a, a relic from our past and our ancestry of this is where it's preferably gonna keep things. So you go into that survival mode. You get the short-term yo-yo. Has anybody ever knows, known anybody that they're like, oh, I'll just eat salads for lunch? How long does that really last? Come on. Not very long, usually. If we're punishing ourselves, we're doing something that we don't enjoy doing with the expectation of getting a result like weight loss. First of all, I would say our objectives, not necessarily are bad there, but we should reevaluate what our objectives are because the means we're trying to get to that objective is skewed. And whenever your path is skewed, you always want to look at your destination and really hone in on what is my destination. Is my goal just to lose weight? Because there's lots of really unhealthy ways you can just lose weight. Who here was a wrestler back in like high school? Or saw the wrestlers when they were trying to make weight? Sweat it off. What kind of stuff? Yeah, sweat it off. They're sitting there running, they're going sa saunas, they're wearing like 30 layers of clothes chewing gum and spitting in the waste back at every 30 seconds. Lots of really unhealthy things, just trying to drop that weight down. And you can drop a lot of weight to make that weigh in, but is it really sustainable if I just lose a bunch of water weight and hydrate myself just to have a number low? <coughs> calories are calories. This is a big one. 
what we eat matters. Toxic food choices really, really matter, okay? So again, going back to like the hunter gatherer days, what kind of nutrition did we eat once upon a time? Yeah. Good carbohydrates. So like the vegetables, the plants, the things that were foraging. Good fat. And what was all the animal products that we're eating then? Were they raised on a farm? Or they were fed antibiotics and hormones and grains and all that stuff? No, it was wild animals. If you get a deer and you eat venison, raw venison from the field versus cow, there's a big taste difference there, right? Or even I'm from the UP. The deer up in the UP versus the deer down here, they taste a lot different. Why is that? Yeah, what do we got down here a lot more than we got up in the UP? Corn. Corn and soy. And what do these deer do? Sit around eating corn and soy all day. So the, the venison down here is more like beef versus up north, it's a lot leaner just because there's not as many resources around. We have not a lot of dairy products. I mean, they did eat some, drink some milks and cheeses and stuff like that. No processed sugar, maybe honey or something like that for like a sweetener. But today we have everything refined. The bleach flour, and now getting clever and re-dyeing the flour after you've bleached it and you've sucked all the nutrients out of it. We have low fat, or not, not good sources of fat, bad sources of protein, pumped full of hormones and antibiotics and all these things that make the animal really big and create a lot more product to sell, but have a huge impact on our bodies, and sugar in pretty much everything. There's a graph here, I think it's one of the next ones. So this one, we're looking at obesity trends over time. You can see the spike up right around here, or right around here. What happened around here? What was that? I can't hear you. Fast food drift? That's a good one. What does HFCS stand for? What do you think? High fructose corn syrup, right before 1980. Well, you can see all these little spikes. So things like uh, three got produced meats. We have refined grains, refined vegetable oils, hydrogenated oils, high fructose corn syrup. What do we notice about these things as we go up this chain? Are they more natural? Or are they less natural? Are these decisions made out of trying to be more healthy? Or trying to be more profitable? Yeah. So a lot of times, all you gotta do is follow the money. If you wanna find the root cause of a lot of the problems in today's society, trace it to the money. So I stick with them, so let's go back a little bit. Um, so insulin, again, that's a, that's a fat storage hormone. It's taking up that sugar in your body, and that's what allows us to store it as fat. Uh, does anybody understand the concept of glycemic index? So there's foods that really spike your blood sugar, and there's foods that don't so much spike your blood sugar. What do you think is better? The stuff that doesn't spike it a lot, right? Because what happens there? So say, for argument's sake, glucose is like the, the bench measure, so glucose is basically a molecule of like pure sugar that your body uses to store sugar versus lentils, basically bean type things. So if we get a huge spike of blood sugar when we eat basically pure sugar, but that little bit of a spike when we eat something like lentils, say that the energy release is the same in both of those. What's better about this? Slower released energy. So it's not this huge spike and this huge crash, like I used to like, back when I was a lot less healthy before I got into the chiropractic lifestyle, I used to love those rock star energy drinks. Like I used to drink those things until my pee would be like neon orange, like really unhealthy. But what always happened when I drank those things? What are they full of? Sugar. Tons of sugar. And then all those B vitamins and all that other stuff that just ramp you up. So I got a lot of energy really quick. And where was I 15, 20 minutes, a half hour later? Riding the wave the other side down, or like those Big B coffee drinks. I swear, if I drink a, if I splurge and I get one of those sugary drinks, I can put like 30 extra shots of espresso in that, 
I guarantee I'm taking a nap within a half hour of drinking that thing, not because I didn't get enough caffeine in it, because I do, when I get them, I usually put a couple extra shots of espresso in there, it's because I'm sugar crashing. Whereas I'm eating a good source of low glycemic food, you still get that energy, but it's slowly released over a longer period of time. So your body's able to utilize it longer, it also helps keep you feeling fuller, and a lot of these foods like that, they tend to have higher fiber content and things that are just better general in general for us anyway. So this is what a lot of our high glycemic foods are. And what are a lot of these foods on there? Breads. But when do we eat a lot of these foods? What time of the day? Breakfast, right? This is what we're starting our day off. Who here has heard breakfast is the most important meal of the day? And in this country, a lot of these are our first choices. I mean, donuts? <laughs> when I was a kid growing up, we always thought donuts was a snack. Like, that was something we got rarely. It was like McDonald's when I was growing up. It was rare we got McDonald's. And there was a girl I was dating once. It was like they would, every Sunday morning, it was donuts for breakfast. And I'm just like, this is, like, weird to me. Like, donuts for breakfast? Really? Like, I can understand having a donut maybe after breakfast as, like, breakfast dessert. You're going there. But that was all they had for breakfast every Sunday morning was donuts. <laughs> so, really useful table here. It kind of breaks down what a lot of our diets are. And what are we seeing? A lot of the grains, a lot of the dairy. What's the problem with dairy? What do you guys think? Has anybody ever noticed like you have a big glass of milk or maybe a big bowl of ice cream? What do you get? Pretend you're not lactose intolerant. Flavor milk Snotty. Has any, have you ever noticed you get more mucus production? No. <laughs> After things like dairy? They do produce more things like mucus, and there are some pro-inflammatory factors with dairy. Now, I'm not somebody, me personally, I still do consume dairy products. I do try to limit them. I don't try to eat as much of them as I used to. But we do have a lot of people who have dairy sensitivities. And I did read a study one time that was talking about how humans are one of the only creatures that continue to drink milk beyond when we're babies. And we are one of the only creatures that actually drinks milk from another animal. So just thinking back to how we were developing and things like that. I mean, milk is an important thing. Clostrum, breastfeeding your baby is very, very, very important. But it's not something that we're designed to be eating all of our lives. Then we have all this stuff. All of our fast foods, all of our school lunches a lot of time, unfortunately. We just had last, uh, I think it was last workshop I was talking, we had one of the chefs for the schools. And I'd ask, I was like, I, I was not, and it was my understanding that school lunches are getting better. And she's like, they're not much better. There's still a lot of this kind of stuff, your deep fried stuff, your onion rings, and all that kind of stuff that you require you to have a vegetable of some kind. But a lot of times that's like peas and corn. So, sugar bondage. Do we think we could be addicted to sugar? Yeah. Why do we get addicted to sugar? What do you think? I can't hear you back there. It's in everything, yeah. But what do we get when we have sugar? Yeah, you get that sugar high. You get that rush when I'm drinking my rock stars once upon a time. And we like that, right? Same concept of that person who has their first drink. And all of a sudden they like how it feels. And so what do they do? They try it again. Or maybe extrapolate it to some of the other street drugs out there. They try, I don't know, something like cocaine or heroin or something else that's really, really bad. But they like that high that they get. And the next time they're, they're going after that same high. But maybe now they gotta do a little bit more to try to get that same high. And they're always chasing that high. I've, I've read several documentaries, or watched several documentaries where people get sucked into that addictive lifestyle. And that's a common thread I find to all their stories is every time I was, I was booting up or snorting something or doing these drugs, I was chasing that first high that I got. I was trying to reproduce that first high that I got and I never could do it. And every time I was trying, I had to do more and I had to do more and I had to do more because what do we get after we do something so long? Yeah, we get used to it. Your body gets used to it. And then we have to do more of it to get a threshold. 
Sugar works in the same way. So there's really some pitfalls to diets. One of them is drinking your calories. And I'm not just talking about like adult beverages and things like that. Go back to like the Big D or like soda. How much sugar is in soda? Like a can of soda, 12 ounce can of soda. Say Mountain Dew. Man. How much do you think? 70. 70 grams, something like that. 40 some grams I think in one serving. But those bottles, that's, that's the other tricky thing is. You get a 20, what are they, 20, 24 ounce bottles these days? Something like that, big old bottles. How many servings are in one of those bottles? Yeah, two and a half, three, something like that. It's more than one. Who here really, if you go buy a bottle of soda, it's like, okay, I drank that much, but I have my one serving, I'll just put the rest away. We tend to drink the whole thing, right? And we don't even necessarily look at it, so you gotta look at what's in there. And then we look at how do they even list sugar these days? How many different ways can you have sugar on your ingredients on the side of the label? I'll give you a hint, if it ends in OSE, it's a sugar, fructose, sucralose. So what are some other ones? Gabalose, maltose, dextrose. All these things are sugar, but they're tricky. They'll put sugar in the ingredients way down. So what's the first ingredient in the list of ingredients? What's that? That's in the most, right? Pretty much everybody knows that. So you're looking at the thing, you're just looking for sugar. Sugar's number like 12 on the list, so it can't be that bad, right? But there's like, 11 other forms of sugar that are the first 11 ingredients. So you're basically eating nothing but sugar. They're just playing a mind game on you and showing you. So you gotta look at the grams per serving and then you gotta look at what a serving is. Like you guys know what a serving size for like say almonds are? About seven or eight. Yeah, it's like eight almonds. Whoever really eats eight almonds? <laughs> like you put eight almonds in your hand and like that's, that's my serving size? That's it. It's tiny, tiny little servings but a lot of times that's the other thing is our portion control. Who here has ever gone overseas anywhere? You know what, they, I talk to people that have come here, you know what a big culture shock for them is? How much, food? How much food? How much food do we eat? You go to the restaurant, what do you expect? A big old plate of food, right? And I'm, I'm not a wuss, I'm gonna eat all my, I'm gonna clean my plate. My mom taught me to clean off my plate. But then you go to these foreign countries, and their serving size, and even our plates. Has anybody noticed over time the plate size is getting bigger and bigger and bigger? There was a study done on this that it shows that as we get larger, our plate sizes, which used to be, this used to be like a dinner plate, something like this. But now an average dinner plate, something like that. But sometimes I go, I just went to a, a Mexican restaurant for my girlfriend's sister's uh, confirmation. They brought me out a platter like this was heaped up to the top. You know how long that lasted me? Like three days, I got three days worth of meals out of that thing because I was like, okay, I need to divide this up and eat it. Now once upon a time, I would have just polished that whole thing up. I would have probably hated myself at the end and wheeled me out in a wheelbarrow type thing. But that's how I would have did it. Skipping breakfast, why is that a bad thing? Yeah, breakfast is what ramps us up for the day. And ideally we want something like a slow release carb. So one thing I was reading a book before I did this workshop was talking about trying to switch our mentality on breakfast to more like a lunch type meal or a dinner type meal. So things like the lentils in the morning. Does anybody ever think of lentils as a breakfast food? Peas and things like that? Not really, because what do we think of? Maybe oatmeal, cereal, that kind of stuff. Eggs are a good one, eggs are high protein. So things that will allow your body to process slower, burn slower, and still release energy throughout the day. Has anybody here ever heard of the paleo, paleo lifestyle? So it's a diet. There's a lot of different diets you can, and I'm not trying to pay, play favorites, I do have a lot about the paleo, but one common theme, the whole concept of paleo is we're trying to match what our ancestors would have eaten back in the hunter-gatherer days before we had all the refined sugars and processed grains and all that kind of stuff. So you're thinking, if I can't kill it and like drag it home and skin it and eat it, or if I can't forage it, it wasn't in my diet. And that's what the paleo people are trying to mimic. And it's not a bad diet. Uh, so lots of non-starchy vegetables, good carbs. 
And these are common themes that I see in a lot of good diets out there. You have no refined grains. So if it's a white powder, leave it alone. Sugar, processed flour, salt to some degree. I mean, I'm not going to bash salt all the way. It's a good seasoning. But tons of salt is a bad thing. Plenty of fruits and berries, although you do have to be somewhat careful with fruits and berries. Why? High glycemic index. It's not much different than eating a candy bar or something, but some of them. And then you think back in like hunter-gatherer days, say I'm from like Northern Euro European heritage. Did they have fruit around all year long? What do they do in the winter? They didn't have fruit available. It's not like they go to the store and buy a bag of clementines or something like that. They just didn't have that in their diet at the time. High amounts of animal protein. And animal protein is another thing we've got to be careful of today because we've removed things so far from the natural state of things. What's the best type of like beefs and stuff like that? Grass fed. Grass fed, exactly. Or like free range, your organics, things like that. Things that aren't pumped full of hormones and antibiotics and everything I can do to try to, has anybody ever watched like a PETA documentary or anything like that? Really, really heartbreaking stuff, how they raise some of these animals, but that's what the, like you go to the supermarket, all like the Tyson chicken and stuff like that, there's, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens to get that packaged chicken that the majority of us eat, not even thinking that, hey, this might not be the best food choice for me. Now I know organic stuff is a little bit more expensive. Quite honestly, if cancers are metabolic disease, who would rather spend a little bit more on healthy food sources, healthy fuel sources now, to potentially save myself a lot of grief, pain, costs down the road when my body starts shutting down because I've been feeding garbage sources of nutrition all my life. And then you have lots of fiber. Why is fiber important? Keeps the mail moving, right? Keeps everything flushed out. It also helps with water regulation, okay? So fiber helps if you have not enough water, it'll pull water from your gut into your body. If you have too much water, it helps pull water out of your body into your gut so your body gets rid of it. The zone diet, who here is familiar with zone diet? Nobody? Okay. It's not as common as one. This one's looking at more of the macronutrients. This would be a good one to talk with Dr. Matt about because he's hired a nutritionist and he's really focused on his macros. So it's basically looking at 40% of my diets are carbs, about 30% are protein, 30% of our good fats. When I'm saying good fats, what are some examples of good fats? What do you guys think? Avocado. Olive oil is a pretty good one. Avocado. Avocado is a really good one. Coconut, another really good one. Yeah, it's nuts and stuff like that. A lot of those have good fats in them. So yeah, a lot of your plant-based fats and things like that are good sources of fat. What are not good sources of fat? Butter. Butter. Depending on the butter, grass-fed butter. Grass-fed butter is actually a really good source. Bulletproof coffee. Has anybody talked to Dr. Ron about that one? Or I used to do it. I don't do it so much anymore because I started eating breakfast again. I used to do nothing but bulletproof coffee in the morning. What's in bulletproof coffee? Grass-fed butter, MCT oil, which is a highly refined coconut oil, and my coffee. And why do I do that? Because I was living more like a keto style at the time, so I'm trying to keep myself, my body preferably burning fat versus sugar. So if I'm giving myself a constant source of good, healthy fats, and my body keeps burning fats, then it just knows, like, okay, I'm gonna burn fat. So when I was doing that kind of diet, I was really limiting the amount of carbs and stuff that I put into my body. Now, me personally, I didn't, my body didn't agree with that one so much. Like, I've, I've tried a lot of different diets, especially over this last year, with when I fast and things like that. Every time I fast, I'm usually switching up something at the end. Quite honestly, the one that I was happiest with, which I, 20 years ago, five, two years ago, you would never have got me, I switched to a whole food plant-based diet for about a month, just to try it. Basically went vegan, minus my cheat days on the weekend when I let myself eat anything I wanted. That, I noticed a lot of change in just how I felt my energy level. And a lot of, it was a little bit of a learning curve because I had to make sure that I was getting enough nutrients. You have to make sure that you're getting all your major nutrients. So some of your animal products are harder, your nutrients are hard to get if you're not eating animal products, like your B vitamins. So you have to get something like nutritional yeast to get that stuff into you. Uh, but really, there's lots of different diets we can approach. But you gotta think, if it's 
closer to how we would harvest it in the field, like growing out of the ground or being picked up, hello, or uh, harvested from an animal or something like that, versus where it's a convenient TV dinner that I pop into the microwave for 10 minutes or whatever it takes to cook one of those things, what's more healthy? The more natural thing or the thing that's been slowly processed down until it's pretty much nutritionally dead. But it's really convenient to eat it, right? And when you have McDonald's, they're not making a killing and a fortune off of being a healthy option out there. What is their shit? Fast and what? Convenient, right? Who here pulls up to McDonald's being like, yeah, I'm gonna get a good, healthy meal here. Every time you pull through McDonald's, what are you thinking? It's gonna be fast, it's gonna be convenient, right? That's why we go through the drive-thru. We don't even gotta get out of our cars anymore. You just pull up to the window and they throw it out the window at you. So this is what healthy food looks like. Trying to get it to that original sources. Who here knows of like ancient grains, things like quinoa? Has anybody ever tried them? Yeah, good. Really, really good. So quinoa, Q U I O it's a really, really good one. That was one of my staples when I was going on the whole food plant-based diet. Or like beans, black beans. But you gotta be careful too. Things like beans, they have lectins in them. That can be hard on your gut. So you wanna make sure you're cooking them well or soaking them. Get some of these hard, harsh things out of them. Like raw kidney beans, they'll tear your guts up if you're just eating raw kidney beans. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to eat a raw kidney bean. That's not why you try to eat a raw kidney bean, but apparently someone did to find out that it tears your guts up. So like soaking your beans, sprouting your beans, fermented foods, what are some good fermented foods? Kimchi. Kimchi, oh I love kimchi. Sauerkraut, I love sauerkraut. 